As we get uh, loaded up, before we go into announcements, there's something I wanted to show you. This was trending on, um, on Facebook not too long ago. All right, everybody, everybody, settle down, settle down. All right. This was trending on Facebook the other day, and I figured you all would get a kick out of this. This was a video out of the Czech Republic um, sometime, I think, uh, last week on, on the 14th. And some of you might have seen this, but if you haven't, so this is a video of, it looks like some sort of indoor floor hockey game, and I think you'll see why I'm showing you the video um, as the video progresses. So you can see they're playing their game. They're playing their game, and then, boom, everybody's running, everybody's running, and I think you will see why. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody was hurt. What? I don't think I would have stuck around. <laughs> I think somebody left their camera there. You can see it's... Is that forfeit? So if you think roof loads don't matter, they do. <laughs> you have the link right here. You can write that down and, and, and get, it was trending, so it's not like it's it's that difficult to find. There, there's a, a, a t-shirt that I, I never got one, but I, I really wanted to, and it, it says, structural engineer, if I'm running from a building, you better try and keep up. And uh, <laughs> I would be running. That's just me. <laughs> That's some second order effects. All right, let's get into it. So welcome back to Reinforced Concrete Design. A few notes. So homework one, tributary area and gravity loads. That's due on Monday. I've already entertained some questions regarding uh, that uh, homework. Does anybody have anything, uh, any questions uh, at all? Um, I would not wait until Sunday night to start it. Um, one point I will make is there's, uh, there's two ways to go about doing the analysis for that problem. One of them is to just do what we did last semester in 312. Another is to use, can I borrow this real quick? Another is to use this. The, uh, the beam uh, analysis aid that I gave you all at the, uh, the beginning of the semester. So um, I, I would take a moment uh, and, um, and address that. Is it too early for the puns? Is that what it is? So, so take a moment and address it. This is concrete design, and my goal is to get you all to crack up every once in a while. Oh, there's only two types of concrete, though, wet and cracked, so it is what it is. <laughs> All right, um, few it. <laughs> oh, even he would agree with that. Um, <laughs> even he would agree with that. There, All right, a few quick announcements. So, um, technical conference next Thursday. If you haven't already uh, volunteered and you're interested, I know that they will, uh, of course, accept volunteers up until the day of. Again, it's a good opportunity to rub elbows with uh, potential employers uh, and things like that. Not a bad idea. Again, if you're going to be around potential employers, just every little bit helps. Okay. Um, I mentioned this in steel design. I'm not 100% sure if the email went out. I'm getting the feeling it didn't. But there's a, a West Virginia Society of Professional Engineer Scholarship where the deadline for submission is Friday. So um, I will um, do, what's that? Okay, all right. So it's, it's in your inbox somewhere. The submission deadline is Friday. So if you're interested, I would uh, get on that. Um, so today, we're going to get into some basic stuff regarding um, material properties. And then we're going to start to introduce beams. We're going to be spending more than half the semester in some form or another on beams, on bending elements. So we're going to uh, start getting into that uh, today. But first, I want to talk a little bit about some concrete properties and steel properties uh, as well. OK. All right. <clears throat> so last time, 
we we pretty much finished everything uh, in regards to loads that we need to assess for this semester. So dead loads, live loads, snow loads, uh, things like that. And um, you all, I think, have a, a a reasonable understanding about how to do a load takedown on a structure to determine basic dead loading components, live loads, uh, and hopefully factoring them, which is, uh, I guess, the main purpose of your first homework assignment. So that's really what we're, we're after uh, in that assignment. Now I want to start looking at the flip side, which is how, you know, the resistance element, how strong uh, concrete can be and how strong the, the reinforcement can be under, uh, under given conditions. And the first thing in order to, first thing that we need to address in order to discuss that is some basics on uh, material properties. Now if you've had CE321, um, a lot of this is going to be pretty, you know, pretty familiar. If not, no big deal because um, most of this relies on basic mechanics of deformable bodies that uh, uh, I think uh, won't be so bad. Okay, so we're going to start off obviously talking about concrete. So we need to review some basic properties associated with concrete. Things like the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity. We're going to call that E sub C. By and large, the most important uh, property that we are going to use in relation to concrete throughout this semester is its compressive strength, FC prime. Okay? I'm assuming if you've had CE321 that that terminology was used, FC prime. Is that term used? Okay. So um, that's going to be, by and large, the, the, the most important numerical value. Now, the most important, I guess, you know, physical response of, of concrete is, by and large, concrete is a material that behaves very, very well when it is subjected to compression. When it is subjected to tension, it doesn't behave that well at all. Which is why we place reinforcement in concrete to arrest its poor behavior in tension. I mean, that's the whole basics. Uh, that's, in a nutshell, reinforced concrete design. Place reinforcement where there's tension. And that's it. Um, class dismissed. I'm just kidding. Um, right. Now I've got your attention. Now I've got your attention. All right. Um, so by and large, that's going to be one of the most important properties. Uh, did I pass sign-in sheet around? I did not. I'm going to get better at that, I promise. Okay. If you took CE321, you did that, right? A cylinder test. By and large, the most fundamental um, uh, material test done in, uh, uh, in assessing concrete. So cast a, a concrete cylinder of a certain dimension. Uh, 6 by 12 is common. 4 by 8 is also common. Um, we usually um, uh, report our compressive strength at an age of 28 days. Um, go through and do our test. And we get a stress strain curve that looks something uh, about like this. And I'm assuming you all have done tests like this before. Uh, if you're going to uh, later on when you take CE321, you'll, uh, you'll remember this stuff. Now, <coughs> what, you'll, um, what you'll no doubt remember from CE321 is that um, concrete is a material that's resulting uh, cured properties are uh, highly a function of its input materials. You know, it's water cement ratio, the admixtures that go into it, the ratio of gravel and sand to Portland cement and water, et cetera, et cetera. And different proportions of, of different materials will result in different classes of concretes and concretes with different compressive strengths. By compressive strengths, basically what I'm referring to is the maximum stress that we get during a, a particular test. So some cylinders might yield a compressive stress of 6,000 PSI or 6 KSI. Some of them might yield 3,000 PSI or 3 KSI. Um, it just depends on the admixtures uh, going into it. The most common value we're going to use is 4 KSI. That's pretty typical for civil engineering structures, not just in the building arena, but in the bridge arena uh, as well. And um, as long as you understand that and the fact that concrete is a, a material that behaves uh, pretty well in compression and pretty poorly in tension. That's really about all you need to know in this course uh, from CE321. We are not going to be doing mixed designs uh, in here for a given beam. I assume that you learn that in CE321. What we're doing in here is determining, well, how wide does that beam need to be? How deep does that beam need to be? How much rebar needs to go in it, uh, et cetera. Sound good? Okay. Now, um, Couple notes. So concrete is a material that is highly nonlinear in its response. In other words, 
It's not like steel where you have a nice linear region of your stress strain curve where you can clearly define what E is, et cetera. It's very nonlinear. You have a very nonlinear uh, stress strain curve. Uh, and that can cause some issues for computing some properties that you need, like the Young's modulus. I mean, remember, Young's modulus is the slope of that linear region. Well, there is no linear region, so what do you use? That's, that can be kind of tough to determine. Okay? We have to determine one um, for, for purposes uh, of design. Um, we have some, I guess I would say, empirical models that we can use in the absence of, of test data. The, they work pretty well. Um, what I would say, though, is that some of the models that we use will make some of you uh, go a little nuts in terms of, uh, of units. Okay? Now, uh, the specification that we use for reinforced concrete design gives us some models that we can use to compute things like Young's modulus and the modulus of rupture and things like that based on a given uh, FC prime. So for instance, if I have an FC prime of 4,000 PSI, I'm going to get a different Young's modulus than if I have 6,000 PSI or 8,000 PSI. Um, we can compute that using the, the, the following relationship. So uh, we have two equations that we can use. One of them is for any concrete at all, and one of them is for uh, just regular normal weight concrete. This is going to be the one that we use most often. Now, before we move on, we're going to have, um, uh, this is Mike, I don't want to say cause some issues, but for those of you that are really, really cognizant of your units, you're going to look at this equation and it's going to drive you a little bit nuts. For instance, let's look at the bottom one. So E sub C is 57,000 times the square root of FC prime. So FC prime is a compressive stress. So it comes out like 6,000 PSI, 7,000 PSI, what have you. I take the square root of that and it yields an answer that's also in PSI and that might seem a, a little strange. This relationship, this square root of FC prime will pop up quite a bit throughout the semester in various forms or another. Okay? So whenever you see a square root of FC prime, okay, you might even want to make a note of this right now. Whenever you see a square root of FC prime, you put in PSI and you get out PSI. Okay, and you might even want to write that verbatim. You put in PSI and you get out PSI. Okay, so you know, I, I guarantee you what's going to happen is somebody's going to um, do a calculation and they're going to say F sub C is F sub C prime is uh, uh, four KSI, and they're going to use four and they're going to get the wrong answer. Okay, you put in PSI and you get out uh, PSI. This is one of those empirical relationships that is basically taking, you know you know, experimental data and trying to fit an equation as best as possible to represent it. So it's one of those things you just kind of have to get used to in the world of concrete design. Don't worry, we'll, we'll explore this probably uh, today. All right, sound good? All right. <laughs> All right. Now, like I said, um, concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in, um, uh, very, very well in uh, uh, compression, but not too well in tension. Tensile of concrete to give you a numerical estimate, depending upon your mix and your admixtures and all that stuff, tensile strength is around 10% of the compressive strength to give you uh, kind of an idea. Now, tensile strength is measured indirectly through a, a modulus of rupture test. Now, I'm not sure what you all did when you took CE321. You might have done a test that looks something like this, where you cast a small concrete beam and actually bend it to failure. And if you look at the, the stresses that you get um, from that test, you find that the, the failure stresses for this test are far lower than a cylinder test, right? You all remember this? Okay, all right. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't taken CE321 yet, no big deal. Just remember that uh, concrete intention is, is much weaker than it is uh, in compression. This is one way to do the test. Another way to do the test is this, is you actually take a cylinder and load it on its side, okay? You actually take the cylinder and load it on its side. This one isn't as common, I think, nowadays than, than this one. I think, by and large, they, they, they both can conform to A and specs. For us, we need a value that we can use um, for, purposes of, um, for purposes of design. So instead of relying on a bunch of test data, we have some pretty convenient models that we can use. A very uh, reasonable estimate for the modules of rupture, that, that 
sort of an indirect measure of its tensile strength is 7.5 times the square root of FC prime times lambda. And lambda is just an adjustment depending upon the type of concrete you're using. Are you using normal weight concrete? Are you using lightweight concrete, uh, et cetera? Lightweight, con lightweight concrete is, of course, lighter, so you can trim up the weight of your structure, but it's a little weaker. So it's just, it's a trade-off. <laughs> All right, sound good? Okay. <coughs> All right, that's um, really all we need to know right now for basic material properties. I, we, we haven't gotten into any examples yet. We will today. But I just want to make sure that you understand, you know, how to compute basic stuff and that for square root of FC prime, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. Okay. Let's talk about reinforcing steel. So there's really two um, uh, very common uh, reinforcing steels that we use. We either use uh, things like welded wire fabric or the most common one, the one we'll use throughout the majority of the semester is rebar. I'm sure everybody in here has seen rebar before, am I right? Okay, <coughs> now, real quick, for all steel, our Young's modulus is 29,000 KSI or 29 million KSI, okay? And that'll become important when we uh, do things like the transform section method because we have to compare that to the modulus of elasticity for, uh, for concrete. Okay, now E is constant for, for, um, for all steels, but the other properties, things like its yield stress and its tensile stress, vary as a function of what grade of steel that you're using. And for rebar, it's, it's pretty easy to identify. So if you're using, let's say, grade 40 rebar, the yield stress is 40 KSI or 40,000 PSI. Arguably, the, um, the most common grade of rebar that we will use in this course and is used in general is grade 60. So grade 60 rebar is going to have a yield stress of 60 KSI or 60,000 PSI. So a concrete compressive strength of 4 KSI and a uh, steel yield stress of 60 uh, KSI or 60,000 PSI, those are the, uh, the two material properties we're going to use most often uh, throughout this semester. Now rebar comes in a, a series of sizes. We have number threes to number 11s, and then we also have number 14s and number 18s. Um, have you all been exposed to like rebar sizes before? All right. If you haven't, just remember an easy way of remembering uh, rebar sizes, at least for the lower bars, is the diameter of a number three all the way up to a number eight. You can find the diameter by just taking the number and dividing it by eight. So the diameter of, let's say, a number five is five eighths of an inch. Sound good? All right. It probably is not a bad idea to take this slide and place a big star around it. Um, uh, this is basically a um, uh, just a summary of rebar sizes for um, uh, for basic the diameter in the area for, for, for just a single bar. Um, it's probably, you know, I tell you what, it's probably not a bad idea if I actually just produce a, a hand with just that on it because you're going to refer to it quite a bit. I'll probably bring that in on, uh, uh, on Friday. Um, we'll probably turn back and forth for, uh, through it today. But by and large, you really need to, to know this. So for instance, if I have a number seven bar, its diameter is 0.875 inches, but its area is 0.6, so you need to make sure that you uh, you understand that. Sound good? Okay. All right. We're not going to use welded wire fabric um, very much. I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of what's going on with it. Um, it's primarily used in things like slab reinforcement or dependent upon what's going on, you might try and use it for shear reinforcement. Um, but basically, you've got welded wire fabric. The first dimension, uh, 6 by 12, indicates that you've got uh, 6 inch longitudinal spacing and 12 inch uh, transverse spacing. The 16 by 8 on the other end um, lists the longitudinal and transverse areas of the wires. So the 16 and the 8 are hundreds of square inch per, uh, uh, per foot of length. But I just wanted to give you an idea. We're really not going to use welded wire fabric uh, throughout the semester. Just wanted to expose you to it. All right. So far so good? Okay. Let's start getting into it. So let's start talking about flexural behavior of concrete beams. Now, what I mean by this is that we're going to start off this semester talking about beams. Okay, beams are going to be our uh, 
Uh, our first real reinforced concrete design topic, and by and large, they're going to be our major reinforced concrete design topic because we're going to be talking about them for quite a while. And the first thing I want to discuss with them is how a concrete beam responds to loading. In other words, <coughs> for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to consider a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. So we'll say, you know, the beam's about yay long, and it's got load on it. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to look at, well, what happens to that beam as I continue to increase the load? And it will essentially experience three stages of behavior. It will behave in what we call an uncracked fashion. It will behave in a cracked fashion. And then it will uh, reach its ultimate strength. Okay, so we're going to take each of these one at a time and try and explain uh, what's going on. So let's talk about the first stage. So in, in, what I'm talking about in this stage is I've got a beam, I've set it down, and I'm applying very, very, very small amounts of load to it, very little load. Now, like I said, concrete is a material that responds very poorly to tension, but that doesn't mean it can resist no tension, okay? You can apply a small amount of tension to a, a reinforced concrete beam, and it will resist the load. Um, the idea is that, you know, going back to basic uh, beam bending theory, you know, remember if I take a beam and bend it, you know, the top of the beam would experience compression, the bottom of the beam would experience uh, tension. Sound good? Okay. In concrete, that relationship will continue to uh, be exhibited until you reach the rupture capacity of the concrete, and then it will crack, okay? So the first thing that we are going to try and determine is what is the cracking moment. Now, it's actually a pretty straightforward equation. I'm going to write some stuff here on the side to kind of explain where this equation is coming from. Um, first off, do you all remember this? You all remember that? If you took mechanics of deformable bodies one way or another, you should remember that. It's one of the most fundamental equations in all the course. And basically, it tells you what are the bending stresses in a beam as it is being subjected to a bending moment. Okay? So it's a function of the bending moment itself, the moment of inertia, and how far we are away from the centroid or from the neutral axis. Remember, at the neutral axis, we have no bending. Below that, we have tension. Above that, we have compression. Right? Make sense? If I say, all right, I want to determine how much moment will generate, let's say, you know, some stress of, let's say, FR, M, Y over I, and then I say, well, how much moment, I'm solving for the moment, multiply both sides by R, divide by Y, and I get that the moment is uh, FR, I over Y. So... It's not, like, it's not like there's some magic behind this equation, okay? It's literally just taking fundamental bending stress and solving for the moment. That's it, okay? Sound good? So the idea is that this equation for a typical beam will tell us how much moment is required to induce cracking in the beam, okay? So it's a function of the modulus of rupture. It's a function of the gross moment of inertia, so we can just treat the beam as if it's one big beam. We don't have to treat the concrete and the rebar separately. We will later, but for now we just can treat it all the same. And Y sub T, the distance from the centroid to the, you know, either the way tippy tippy top of the beam or the way, you know, bottom of the beam, whichever side is experiencing tension. Right? Sound good? Okay. Don't worry, we're, we're going to have an example here that, that illustrates this. Everybody got this? All right. Let me erase this. Okay. So let's look at the following example. Okay. <laughs> we'll take our time with this and make sure that we understand this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So we've got a beam that's being subjected to a bending moment of 25 foot kip. Okay. And I want to determine the bending stress on the top of the beam and on the bottom of the beam. So this is um, really going to go back and explore some of those mechanics of materials uh, or mechanics of deformable bodies concepts that you haven't used in a while. Um, we're also going to try and determine what is the cracking moment for this beam. So this will tell us whether or not the beam has cracked. Okay. <coughs> now, let's make sure we understand what's going on with the diagram. So 
We're, imagine we have a beam, you know, going like this, and we again we've used our secret weapon of structural engineering, you know, samurai sword or lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan. We've cut through the section, and what do we see? We see a beam that's 12 inches wide and it's 18 inches tall. Okay. Now, notice where the rebar is. We place the rebar in the bottom of the beam, right? We're assuming that that's the region that's experiencing tension, right? Make sense? Remember, we place the rebar where we're experiencing tension. And specifically, we have placed three number nine rebars. So each, each number nine bar has an area of one square inch. It's pretty easy to remember. So three number nines, that's an area of three square inches. It doesn't really matter for this problem, but stuff like that will, uh, will matter later. Sound good? All right. So let's, let's go into this a little bit. Example two. Is that two A or is it just two? Just two. All right. Okay. Okay. So let's let's calculate some properties of this beam. Okay. Now let's first calculate the gross moment of inertia. Now before we do that, let's write down some properties. What is the width of this beam? There we go. What is the height? All right. Now the gross moment of inertia is really just the moment of inertia of that rectangular section. Let's, let's uh, dig into those memory banks a little bit. Who remembers what's the moment of inertia of a rectangle? There we go. I heard it from a few people, so that's good. BH cubed over 12, or AB cubed, whichever, whatever you want to call it. BH cubed over 12. So that is 12 inches times 18 inches cubed over 12. So now I'm making you all do math. Oh, goodness. We're barely two weeks in, and he's breaking out the calculator. Yes, sir. No, no, no. The, the, that, that's a good question. That's if, if the beam is cantilevered, but we didn't say that. We just said the beam was subjected to a moment of 25 foot kips. You are raising a very good point that if you have a cantilevered beam, you would put the rebar on the top. Yes. All right. Sound good? I did have a test problem uh, last semester where I gave them a, a cantilever beam, and everybody got the beam design for the most part right, but they forgot to put the rebar on the top. And I said, well, if that cantilever beam was supporting, you know, like a, a party deck, and you know, people were out there dancing, that that would be a short party. They wouldn't have time to whip, let alone name it. So just <laughs> there, more laughs. There we go. What do we got for this? Now, language. Inches to the fourth. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. Now remember, let's remember, we have a cross section that looks something like this. Okay? And we're saying that the centroid of that cross section is somewhere about right here, or about like that. And We have a bending stress profile that ultimately sort of does this, right? Right? Okay. Now, this is the region down here that's experiencing tension. I, I guess I should just leave it at three bars. Um, so really what we need is this dimension right here. We need that dimension. The dimension from the centroid to the extreme tensile fiber. So we'll call that dimension Y sub T. So can anybody tell me what Y sub T is? Say it again. Nine inches because it's 18 over 2. Right? Because this dimension here, that is 18. 
Sound good? Yeah. Okay, all right. Now, the moment, what's the moment that's being applied? Oh, here, let me just tap away. Anybody see a problem with this? There we go. So what do we do to convert that to inches? Do we multiply or divide? There we go. Multiply. So 300 inch kits. So therefore, the tensile stress at the bottom, we'll call that F sub T, is what, MY over I? So MY over I. Uh, so that is what, 300 inch kips times 9 inches divided by 5832 inches to the fourth. So what does that come out to be? Say it, say it again. Let's do three. Four, four, six, what? Four, four, six, three. Okay, three decimal places. What are the units? It's, it's a stress. Kips per inch squared, or KSI. Right? So, just for sake of discussion, how would I convert that to PSI? Multiply by 1,000. So would you agree then that F sub T is 463 PSI? Sound good? They're okay with that. All right. We'll call this the answer. And I'll call this the answer to, let's say, part A. Okay? because there's two parts to this problem. All right, so far so good? Okay, now, let's be clear on something. When we perform this calculation, we're assuming that the concrete remains uncracked, okay? In order to determine whether or not the concrete has in fact cracked, we have to determine what is the modulus of rupture and ultimately what is the cracking moment, okay? So let's do that now. Okay, let's, let's, let's go past that. Let's now determine how much it would take to crack this beam and if this calculation is correct or not. All right. Everybody okay with this? Am I okay to move on to the next one? Next panel? All right. All right. Now let's determine the modulus of rupture. Goodness, that's horrible. Now the modulus of rupture is when the concrete experience is cracking. So what is that? What is the modulus of rupture? Got to go back into your notes. Oh, no. Nope. So, all right, there we go. So 7.5 times lambda times the square root of FC prime. So let's, let's come up with a couple values. What's lambda? One. Why, why did you say lambda is one? There we go. So I'll put that over here on the side. Normal weight. Bless you. And I'm actually going to write that out so that you all have that in your notes. Okay. Now, F sub C prime, what's, what, or F prime sub C, um, what is that? 4,000 PSI. Now, remember, in this calculation, you put in PSI and you get out PSI. Okay, so, so be cognizant of that. So this is going to be F sub R is 7.5 times a lambda of 1 times a square root of 4,000 
and I'll go ahead and put this on the outside, PSI. So what's this come out to be? Say 474, is that what you said? So we'll say 474.3 or something like that. It doesn't really matter. All right. What does that mean? Yeah, okay, you're, you're on to something, Mr. Crookshanks, but I'm going I'm to extend that discussion a little bit. So um, the modulus of rupture, in other words, the point at which the beam first experiences cracking is 474 PSI. Now, how much stress did we get from that 25 foot kips? 463. So had the beam cracked yet? No, but it was real close, right? So it was close. So if we go back and compute our cracking moment, should it be like 600 foot kips? Or should it be really close to 25? Should be pretty close to 25, right? Let's see what we get. So our cracking moment is going to be FR IG over YT. Okay, so 474.3 PSI. All right, what's our moment of inertia? There we go. Getting back into the swing of things, right? Y sub T. All right. So let's do some number crunch and tell me what you get. Who didn't bring a calculator? Say it again. Uh, okay, okay, there we go. Well, let, let's the calculation you probably carried came out to something like 307, 350, right? That's the number you got. Okay, the number that you calculate is 307, 350, but the units, based on what I have on the screen right now, what are those units going to be in? It's, it's, a, it's a moment, so inch pounds. Okay, so take it one step at a time. If I want to go from inch pounds to inch kips, I would take this and do what? Divide by 1,000, right? So that's 307.35 um, inch kips. Now, how do I get to foot kips? There we go. All right, so what do we get? 25 point what, 6, 1, something like that? Now, does that value make sense based on what we got before? Yeah, because we originally, based on 25 foot kips, we had a stress of about, what, 463? But it cracks at 474, so that moment better be pretty close at 25, right? And it did. It came out to be 25.61, so this is the answer. Part B. All right. That's not the same. Well, first off, okay, okay. well, that, that sort of went, <laughs> went off of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let me, let me pull out the, the homework real quick because since, since we'll, right, we'll go back to that real quick. First off, before I go to the homework, does anybody have any questions about this? Yes, sir. We will lay, I mean, we're, we're getting to it. We, I, I promise we will. It doesn't really matter now because the beam has not experienced cracking. 
like let's put it like this. The cracking moment for this beam is 25.6 foot kicks, right? Now, problem applied a moment of what, 25? So it didn't matter. If the moment was over this, if the moment was 50 or 40, then it would matter. Right now, it doesn't, okay? Yes, yes. Because, let, let me put it like this. Um, while the Young's modulus of steel and concrete is quite different, we're ta you, you got to understand, we're talking about moments that are really small. And in this range, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you were to go through and calculate the actual ultimate maximum capacity of this beam, it's going to be far larger than 25.6, okay? The rebar will matter, but not right now, okay? Sound good? When we experience cracking, what we're going to do is assume that all that concrete that's in tension is completely ineffective, and the only thing that's there to resist the tension is the rebar, then we're going to have to start doing some extra counts. All right. Sound good? We, we will use it, I promise. All right, now, going back, let's, no, 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 I, I, I want to I address this stuff, I, because if you have questions, I guarantee you that there's probably other students that have this question as well, so. All right, so the question was on, the, on this, okay, so here's the homework assignment, and we've got factored moments and factored loads. By factoring moments, I mean this, okay? That's what it means to factor moments, okay? 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times live because you're applying those appropriate load factors to each load component. Does that make sense? But that's different than, than determining the moment, okay? If you go back to this, remember when we had this problem? And then we said, okay, we have a pressure load. Let's then take that load and distribute it to this beam. Okay, so we got to, to this right here. The factored moment issue is to determine the moment. Like, let's say this beam right here. If I asked for the moment, I would be asking for what's the maximum moment on this beam. And you should be able to determine what's the maximum bending moment on this beam using either a moment diagram or the, the guide I gave you at the beginning of the semester. But that should be pretty straightforward. Does that answer your question? I mean, this is important stuff, so I really want to make sure everybody's clear on this. Everybody else good? Yes, yes, because uh, because you were given a uh, a live load of 60 psf, but this is an unreduced live load, so you then need to reduce that live load on each element. So you'll perform live load reduction on the floor beam and live load reduction on the column. You have to do live load reduction for both of them. Yes. Yes. Also, the live load element factor is different. The KLL. Yes. You're exactly. Yes. You're exactly right. Everybody else, all right with this? Everybody good? Okay. Uh, on number two, I'm not worried about live load reduction or factoring or anything like that. The issue with number two is that, let, let's just assume that that's a factored load. That does, what's up? All right. What? I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. Well, if you applied a factor of 1.6, just divide your answer by 1.6. <laughs> okay. No, you're just the, the point with this problem was I'm not I'm not concerned with complicating the load. I was concerned with complicating the floor system because now it's not a nice little grid. You've got beams framing in all over the place. You, you see what I mean? But yeah, the idea is just here's a load. Go through and distribute it. I'm, I'm out of the loop on something. <laughs> I don't know. He pointed to you. All right. Is everybody good on the homework? Everybody good? 
Okay, all right. Okay. Now, I do want to at least start into this problem. This problem is a little more complicated. All right, guys. Guys, dude. All right. Um, this problem's a little more complicated because um, the beam is not a rectangle. So, does anybody remember how to compute the moment of inertia of that? There, there we go. Well, it's not averaging. Remember, you got to use that. <laughs> Why is so funny? No, but you're on the right track. I mean, you, you break it up into its separate components, and then ultimately you use the parallel axis theorem. Remember that? I plus AD squared. I, I know you've done it before at some point or another, whether you did it in statics or you did it in deformables. Don't worry. We will take it a step at a time. But ultimately, what we're going to need to do with this problem is the exact same thing that we did with the last one. What makes it complicated is the fact that we don't have a rectangle and we have to compute the moment of inertia. Now, um, let's see what time it is. Okay, I, I don't want to get too heavy into this example. Um, we will uh, tackle this example next time. But what I will say uh, is, is, uh, is this. Okay, so we're going to look at this beam in a few different lights. We're going to try and determine what's the cracking moment. Um, What's the uh, 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 stresses on this beam uh, based on a given loading? Again, trying to go back and sort of review some of that stuff in mechanics of deformable bodies that you might not have had uh, recently. It might have been a while since you've had that, so we'll sort of take our time with it. And then the next step is to address uh, basically, uh, kind of something that, uh, that, that Mr. Lewis brought up, and that is when do we uh, account for the steel? Well, the, the answer is we account for the steel when we've cracked the beam. Because when we've cracked the beam, we assume that all the concrete that's in tension is ineffective because it's, in fact, separated. So the only uh, component that can resist tension uh, is the rebar. And that's when we start taking into account uh, things like the rebar. We start using the transform section method. And we see that the, uh, the rebar and the area of the rebar actually begins to matter. Um, so the next maybe one or two lectures. If you're feeling a little nervous about deformable, if it's been a while since you've had it, or um, you know, you're just feeling a little nervous, don't worry. This next couple of lectures is meant to cover important stuff related to concrete design, but also kind of serve as a little bit of a refresher for some of that stuff you might not have seen for a while. Sound good? All right. That's all I got for you today. I'll see you next time.